All right, other alkaline solutions from acid alkalis and titrations. Now, the point they're trying to make is that apart from ammonia reacting with water and producing ions, there are also some other solutions that we call alkaline because when they're dissolved in water, they actually react with water. Doing so, they produce some hydroxide ions. As soon as they do, they're considered as alkaline solutions. Take a look at this example of carbonate. This is sodium carbonate. It is reacting with water and then it is producing sodium hydroxide and sodium hydrogen carbonate. Sodium hydroxide is clearly positive ions of sodium and negative ions of hydroxide. Since this is alkaline, so that's why we call this whole system as alkaline. Though it does not have any hydroxide ions, but when it is dissolved in water, it reacts with it and this is produced. We actually give it an ionic shape, the more appropriate, the more understandable shape. If you take a look at this, Carbonate ions, when dissolved in water, produce hydroxide ions and hydrogen carbonate ion. This is a very good uh, ionic equation to give you an idea how carbonate ions, and we have already taken out the spectator ions. There is no sodium over here. There is no sodium here and here. So, of course, sodium was the only spectator ion. Carbonate ions, when dissolved in water, produces hydroxide ion. Hence, carbonate are alkaline, but... To continue with this, there are not many soluble carbonates. Sodium carbonate is soluble, potassium carbonate is soluble. They are both alkalis with pH greater than 7. This is because they produce hydroxide ions in the solution. Only some of the carbonate ions react in water, so their solutions are still weakly alkaline. They're not strongly alkaline. Don't consider that they would react in a very good, in a fast way, and they would produce a lot of hydroxide ions. No, that's not the case. Actually, only some of the carbonate ions react and only a few hydroxide ions are produced. pH is though greater than 7, it is alkaline, but it is weakly alkaline. Now, let me remind you, actually, there is a, a point that they have missed. So, sodium carbonate, the formula for this is Na2CO3. Potassium carbonate, the formula for this is K2CO3. And I, I ask you to note one more ammonium carbonate, which is NH4 twice CO3. These three are the only carbonates that are soluble in water and produce alkaline solutions. Okay, mm -hmm. so yes. these three are the ones that we consider at the level of Rio pores. That's about it. This topic has not much to offer, only this, that carbonate ions are soluble in water and act alkaline because of producing OH, but that to a weak limit. That's about mm -hmm. it. So let's move to the chapter we will add. Let's go for a quick recap before we start today's work. So we were doing in our last setting acid bases and salt preparations. The previous one was acid alkalis and titrations because we specifically talked about alkalis in details. This is about acid bases and salt preparations. Base is a bigger, broader term. Base means anything that can neutralize an acid. It doesn't exactly has to be water soluble, it can or it cannot be. So this is actually a bigger broader term we're using at this point because we're going to use it for salt preparation, which brings me to the start of this topic, salts. Anything is known as a salt when a hydrogen is replaced by a metal in a compound, mm -hmm. right, or in an acid, okay? So it forms a compound that is known as a salt. We have considered many examples of salt, Let's take some examples of parent acids and the salt types of salts they're going to produce. So hydrochloric acid, remove this edge, replace it with a metal. Sodium is a metal. This is an ACL. This is an example of a chloride salt. So hydrochloric acid only produces chloride salts. Nitric acid would produce nitrates, sulfuric acid, sulfates, ethanoic acid, ethanoids, phosphoric acid, phosphates. So it's a very good way of representing how a parent acid in which we just replace hydrogen with a metal, and it can be really any metal. It can be transition metal, it can be a reactive metal, it can be any metal, and that would be a salt. So there are thousands of salts that we can talk about. Okay, so yeah. moving on, <clears throat> salts are also formed when hydrogen in an acid is replaced by ammonium. That is another example. We already took example of ammonium carbonate. Here we have examples of ammonium chloride, ammonium sulfate. These salts contain the ammonium ion. These are salts that are made up of com 
completely all non-metals. Yeah, that is possible. There can be a salt which has no metal in it. Ammonium chloride, ammonium sulfate are very good examples of those. Moving on. Since we are, to, we are supposed to talk about how to make salts or prepare salts, we are supposed to discuss reactions of acids that give us salts. So let's start. The first reaction of acid that can give us salt is the reaction with metal. It's a very easy reaction and there is a mnemonic by the name of MASH that you can remember. Metal plus acid gives us salt plus hydrogen. However, there are a few things about it that we need to understand. Any metals below hydrogen in the reactivity series don't really react with dilute acids. So metals above hydrogen in the series, they do. That would be a displacement reaction. The higher the metal in the reactivity series, the more vigorous the displacement reaction would be. And of course, it's then going to produce salt and hydrogen. Since it's going to be an exothermic and vigorous reaction, the hydrogen may catch fire. So that's why we don't mix this with metals such as potassium, calcium, sodium, because their reactions would be too violent, and those reactions are not even carried out in school labs. Moving on. So magnesium and acids, magnesium, so sulfuric acid, fizzing, colorless gas evolves. If tested with a lighted splint, a pop sounds produced. This is the test for hydrogen. We'll study it in the last chapter of inorganic. And this is an exothermic reaction. The metal would gradually disappear, would convert into a colorless solution of magnesium sulfate. Since it's formed a soluble salt, salt will dissolve. You can see the fizzing in front of yourself in this diagram. The same reaction would occur with magnesium and a hydrochloric acid. And again, it would form a magnesium salt and give us hydrogen. Now, if we keep both of these reactions in front of us in the form of ionic equations, you would notice that we can easily cancel out the negative ions. Be it the sulfate ions or it the chloride ions, we're left with this equation, which clearly tells us about the displacement. No matter which acid magnesium is going to react with, it is going to produce for us the same result. Magnesium plus hydrogen ions give us magnesium ions plus hydrogen gas. So really, it does not matter which acid we are reacting it with. Every time, the result would be same. It would produce a magnesium salt and would give the hydrogen gas. This was an example of a more reactive system. If we're to, supposed to talk about a less reactive system, then we can consider zinc, comparatively less reactive. So if you see zinc goes for the same kind of reaction, producing sulfate with sulfuric acid, producing chloride with hydrochloric acid, and produces the same hydrogen gas. If you work out the ionic equation, you would see that the ionic equation is literally the same as magnesium. It's just that the magnesium's symbol has been replaced by zinc. Rest, every single thing in this equation is same. So it gives us an idea how these equations are going to be. But that's not it means that's not the only reactions by we can produce salts. Acids can react with metals. The second thing acids can react with to produce salts would be bases. Base is anything that can neutralize an acid. Usually that are metal oxides, such as copper oxide, magnesium oxides. These are bases that are usually insoluble in water. However, ammonia can also be taken as a base. Metal hydroxides are bases too, but it's better to call them alkalis since most of the hydroxides are soluble in water. Not all of them, but most of them. So talking about the insoluble oxides, copper oxide can react with sulfuric acid from copper sulfate in water. Now, this can be learned with, uh, again, the same way a metal oxide can react with an acid, can give a salt plus water. We can simply replace this metal oxide with base. So it's BASW. It's another mnemonic that we can remember to give us an idea how this reaction would go. This specific is a neutralization reaction because the base neutralizes the acid or vice versa to form water a neutral system. So if we talk about bases and alkalis and if we compare them at this point, you'll understand that um, metal oxides tend to dissolve in water to form alkalis, uh, sodium oxide, potassium oxide, they can do the same, which means group one oxides will give us the hydroxides for group two. Not all of them can do the same, but yeah, calcium oxide when can be considered for another example. Apart from that, ammonia can actually be dissolved in water. And this actually reacts with water to form ammonium cyanide hydroxide ions. That's why it's known as an alkali. So 
although it's not exactly a metal oxide, but it can act as an alkene. Which brings us to our next point, the alkenes and their reactions with acids. Metal hydroxides are usually alkenes. So alkenes can react with an acid to give us salt and water. So there you go. You have another mnemonic to remember. And that's the third kind of reaction that can produce salt. Along with that, water. So if we talk about dilute hydrochloric acid with sodium hydroxide, something that we have considered before in the titrations experiment, that's easy. It would give us the idea that the ionic uh, equation would be OH negative from alkali, H positive from acid would give us water. It really does not matter which salts form because that would be considered as spectral ions in uh, ionic equations. But if you're going through salt preparation, it's all that matters. Right. So mm -hmm. apart from this, that we understood, this is the an equation. If you remember for the previous one, it says, I specifically asked you that we can get this equation over, out of it, that O2 negative, which is actually a solid, can react with 2H positive, which is coming from an aqua solution of an acid, can give us water, H2O liquid, and this way, we can mention it its equation. We can also mention its equation uh, with copper oxide here and forming copper ions next, but that's another way to do it. That's probably uh, because copper is solid and can be mentioned properly if we go by your method uh, written in the book by cutting out systems. So there can be copper ions in aqua solution and water. You may subtract copper ions as a whole from the equation copper ions or copper, but you'll get the previous equation. It's okay to write both. Both of them are acceptable since there is a contradiction or ambiguity with these reactions. So their ionic equations are usually not asked in exams. So you can stay at ease. Moving on. The fourth kind of reaction, a carbonate salt can react with an acid to produce salt, water, and carbon dioxide for which you can go for the mnemonic CASWC, and you can see some reactions over here. Take a look, okay, copper carbonate can react with sulfuric, nitric, or hydrochloric acid. They give us different copper salts, but along with that, every time carbon dioxide and water, as it's producing a gas, gas would be given off in effervescence or fizzing, you can easily recognize it. This gas can turn lime water milky, so there is another test to it. Now, Direction between carbonates and dilute acids can also be considered again in the same way. And the previous equation that we studied is somewhat similar to this one. Though we were previously discussing water, this is with acid and the results are slightly different. It's producing for us carbon dioxide gas and water. So that's the an equation for this one. This completes our four specific reactions that we studied earlier. Carbonates are not mentioned as bases on the slabus, only metal oxide, metal hydroxides, and ammonia are. So carbonates reaction will not be considered as a neutralization reaction to be specific. Okay. So remember, it's the same acid that is reacting with the metal to produce salt plus water that is reacting with the base to produce salt my bad, it wasn't water with metal, it was actually hydrogen. And that was reacting with the base to produce salt plus water. It is doing the exact same reaction with an alkali salt plus water, but when it reacts with the carbonate, it gives a salt plus water plus carbon dioxide. So that's how it works. These are the four reactions you have studied so far in terms of reactions of acids. So acids react with metals, bases, alkalis, and carbonates to produce salts. These are all reactions considered for salt preparation. Why? Because all four of them can produce salts. Which actually clarifies whatever we have studied previously and brings us finally to salt preparation. Now, salt preparation is all, all, all about producing a specific salt. When I say the word salt, uh, you do understand that we have a positive ion that is mostly a metal, but that can be ammonium. And then there is a negative ion, which is our anion. 
and salt is composed of these two ions. So what your book is going to do is that before you go on with producing salts, you need to understand whether the salts are soluble or insoluble in water. Why? Because the method we're going to use will depend upon the fact whether the salt is soluble in water or insoluble in water. So in order to remember that, we have this big, huge table. Take a look at this table. And I'm going to scroll a little bit. <clears throat> Just a second. Let's zoom out a little bit so that we can see the whole table. Yeah, that's better. I hope you can see. So if you see the table, you'll find the key at the bottom of the table, which tells us about soluble salts, which are completely yellow compartments. Then there is a big orange square in the insoluble compartment. And then there is a big orange outline, but internally it's not as orange, it's dull. And that's almost insoluble or very slightly soluble. That seems a little bit tricky. Good part, we've only three of those boxes. So if you start with these ones, these ones which seem to be pretty different, that is silver sulfate, that is calcium sulfate, and that is calcium hydroxide. For the rest of these, insoluble means they won't dissolve in water, insoluble means they will dissolve in water. So how do you really remember these? There is a very good way of remembering it. So I am going to turn this table easier for you. First, remember these three salts, the ones that are insoluble, uh, sorry, almost insoluble. These three, silver sulfate, calcium sulfate, calcium hydroxide. Then you need to remember the soluble salts so that you can really differentiate them from insoluble ones. And we are of course going to remember insoluble salts too. So one good hint is that all nitrates, as you can see, are soluble. So remember the nitrate that it would always produce a soluble salt. If you notice this line, all of them are soluble, all of them are soluble, all of them are soluble. So these three names are also representing the cations whose uh, salts are always soluble. So nitrates, ammonium, potassium, and sodium salts are all soluble, all right? If you mm -hmm. want to add to the list, I ask my students that they can really add this to the list. These are all soluble too. Athenoids. Okay. So mm -hmm. in chlorides, only two of them are insoluble. That is silver and lead. In case of sulfate, barium and lead. In case of carbonate, all of them are insoluble except ammonium, sodium, potassium. In case of hydroxide, all of them are insoluble except ammonium, sodium, potassium, and barium. That's about it. That way you can remember it. These are a total of six to seven points that you need to remember. Good part, your book is already quoting those six to seven points. Six points, actually. All sodium, potassium, ammonium compounds are soluble. All nitrates are soluble. Easy. Chlorides are soluble except lead two and silver. Sulfates are soluble except lead to barium, silver, and calcium. All carbonates are insoluble except sodium, potassium, and ammonium, which I told you before at the start of this very lesson, even from the previous chapter, not in this chapter. I told you this piece of fact uh, in the previous lesson when I was explaining the other things. Okay. So, the last one most metal hydroxides are insoluble or almost insoluble, except sodium, potassium, and ammonium hydroxide. Calcium hydroxide is slightly soluble in water. So there you go. You've done all the anions and cations. But there is a hint, and this is a very true hint to talk about. It can seem a bit frightening to have to remember all this, but it isn't as difficult as it looks at first sight. Except for carbonates and hydroxides, most of these compounds are soluble. Learn the exceptions in sulfates and chlorides. The reason for the exceptions in carbonates and hydroxide is that all sodium, um, potassium, and ammonium ions uh, compounds are soluble. Easy peasy. That's not difficult. If you go with all of these lines and understand them, this table is going to come as a piece of cake to you. So, the three points that I've discussed already, we're going to discuss them again. If you're supposed to make soluble salts like sodium, uh, except sodium, potassium, and ammonium, you can take a solid, react it with an acid in the following way. 
acid plus metal. This is only for moderately reactive metals. From magnesium to iron in the reactivity series, you're not allowed to do that with sodium or potassium or calcium because they are too reactive. It is acid plus metal oxide or hydroxide. Finally, acid plus carbonate. Whichever mixture you use from these points, the method is basically the same. So if you notice, those all for those types that I discussed previously are here. Except for sodium, potassium, and ammonium salts, all kinds of salts can be made by this practice. And this would bring us to our activity. So with activity five, the practical about making copper two sulfate crystals, since we already said we are not going to make any ammonium, sodium, or potassium salts with these methods, hence copper two sulfate. The method given over here is, is going to be pretty much the same for any of these combinations. If you're reacting a solid with an acid, use this activities method. Keep this method in mind because you will be asked to reproduce this in your theory paper. Okay? So the practical procedure goes like this. You measure 50 cubic centimeter of your dilute sulfuric acid in a beaker and you heat it on a tripod and gauze using the Bunsen burner. How would you know if you would require the sulfuric acid? That's a question, a million dollar question. The practical was about making a certain salt. You never knew which acid you wanted to start with. So why this acid? Can you take a guess? Mm -hmm. No. Okay. Now, let me tell you, in order to produce copper to sulfate, what are you supposed to react? This is something that we have told you previously. Okay. We told you that you can use this or this. Remember, you're supposed to produce a sulfate salt. Which acid produces a sulfate salt? Sulfuric acid. This we told you when we were talking about parent acid at the very start of this chapter. As soon as you see the negative ion's name, anion's name at the end of the salt, you should immediately consider which acid you're going to use. If the name considers acid of nitrate, you wouldn't be using sulfuric acid, you would be using nitric acid. If there was a chloride salt, you'd be using hydrochloric acid. If it was a phosphate salt, you'd be using a phosphoric acid salt. Phosphoric acid, sorry. So I hope this part of the name gives you an idea that this acid needs to be sulfuric acid. And this part of the name gives you an idea which metal we need. Now, we can either take sulfuric acid and react with, with copper metal, but does that work for this reaction? You already know anything below hydrogen in the reactivity series will not react di directly with acid. So if we talk about the reactivity series right below hydrogen, we have copper, silver, and gold, which means copper, will not directly react, or these will not directly react with acid. So I really can't use this method. Then I can use, pick this method. I can use sulfuric acid over here. I need the metal oxide, so I can use copper to oxide, or I can use copper to hydroxide. Yeah, both of them would work great. Or I can even go by this method. I can use sulfuric acid, and I can use copper to carbonate. That's how you decide, okay? It's up to you to decide which reactants, which acid, which alkali, which oxide, which hydroxide, which carbonate or which metal you need to take if you want to produce a certain salt. And that's what we have been discussing previously. So don't just consider it as a common step in the book. They tell you which acids and which salts you're going to react and you won't know anything about it. No, it doesn't work that way. You are the one who is supposed to consider which elements, uh, which compounds or which acids or which things you need to combine to form the salt. But we will make it easier for you after the practical. What to combine? There would be very good two hints in your book. And I love this part of the book about this chapter that they are going to make it so easy for the students with those two hints. Let's go with the practical activity first. We'll hint, read the hints after. 
So this practical activity says that we take our asset up around 50 cubic centimeter in a beaker, we heat it on a tripod and pass using a Bunsen burner. We add a spatula full of black copper dioxide. There you go. He never used uh, carbonate, he never used hydroxide, he used oxide. Well, it's really up to you. You could have used the other things as well, and there wouldn't be a problem. The metal would literally be the same. React with it and continue heating. If all of the copper dioxide disappears and more copper dioxide uh, is added, and that appears, disappears as well, until unless there comes a point that the copper dioxide is not disappearing anymore, there is still some left in the beaker, still the mixture well to make sure no more would react. At this stage, you have added an excess of copper dioxide, so much so that there is some left unreacted. There is more than enough of copper dioxide to react with the acid. That means acid has completely reacted, just copper dioxide has been left, so acid has been neutralized. That's how we know. And that's important to neutralize acid. Why? I'm going to discuss it a little further. Now filter off with the excess copper dioxide and transfer the filtrate solution, which is blue, which is actually copper sulfate solution to an evaporating basin. And the solution we have now is copper sulfate. That's the reason why we made sure all of the acid has been neutralized. If there was any acid left in the system, let's say there was any H2O support in the system, that would have easily been dissolved in water pass through over here, and this would still have some H2S support as an impurity. So we wanted to make sure that all of the H2S support has been reacted. Now there is some copper dioxide left, but that's the best part. Copper dioxide is solid, it is insoluble. It would not dissolve, it would not pass through, and would stay on top of this, and there would be no copper sulfate oxide over here. Am I my bad, not copper to sulfate, copper to oxide, all right? So this means there will have been no impurity in this solution. That's why we make sure of this. That's why actually we started off with using the acid at, uh, with the solid in the first place. That's why it's mentioned over here. Because the solid is insoluble, will not pass through. That's why we have been considering excessive solid and a certain amount of acid. This is the equation. It forms copper sulfate in water. We're going to heat it up and we're going to evaporate all of the water, concentrate the solution. We keep heating until a saturated solution is formed. We can test it, this by dipping a glass rod into the solution. If there are some crystals that are formed on the glass rod, that means we are doing it perfectly. We have a saturated solution that we require. Now, when we remove it, we, the solution is very close to saturated and crystals will also begin to form in the solution. Stop heating. Allow it to cool slowly at room temperature. Don't try to cool it too fast by putting it in some freezer or freezer or elsewhere. No, that's not a good idea. So that large crystals can form. If you try to, uh, to cool it fast, it doesn't give it enough time for large crystals to form. Remove the brew crystals from the reaction mixture by filtration and just pouring off the remaining solution. The crystals can be dried by blotting them in a paper towel or they can be left to dry in a warm place. And that's how easy it is. Now, the question arises, why did not we evaporate the whole water? Why not simply evaporate the whole water? Why uh, go for some kind of these steps that we stop it heat, heating it, we remove it, we wait for it to be cooled down, then we can dry it in a warm place. Why go with all this hassle and why not just evaporate all of the water by boiling it? Now, it seems that we can evaporate all the boil water, but uh, rather than crystallizing the solution slowly, evaporating to dryness would give you uh, copper to blue crystals. But if you try to evaporate all of the water, it would produce a white powder. Why? Water is a part of the salt. If you even try to evaporate that water, this part of the salt, the salt would be turned to white. This is white copper sulfate, which has no water. This is hydrated or it has water of crystallization. This is blue. So it's the same salt, which appears to be blue when water is combined with it. And when it is deprived of water, it appears white. The one that is blue is known as hydrated. 
The one that is white is known as anhydrous, which means without water. We actually want these blue crystals. That's why we do not boil it to evaporation. That way we won't get blue crystals. So if you're gonna go ahead and make magnesium sulfate crystals, what you can do is that you don't need to take magnesium upside down. Magnesium is a very reactive metal. It can directly react with sulfuric acid. So take excess magnesium, which is solid. Always take the solid in excess and acid in a certain amount, lesser amount. There would be a lot of physics. The reaction does not need to be heated because magnesium is extremely reactive. It was fizz, gaps would be given off, and the fizzing stop, and there is still some magnesium left in the beaker. This means all the acid has reacted. You can continue with the same steps. Again, concentrate the solution, check it with a glass rod. When crystals start forming, we stop the heating, we allow it to crystallize, we let it cool down at room temperature without uh, cooling it too quickly, and then we can leave it in a warm place to dry. There you go, you have magnesium sulfate crystals. Again, the crystals have photo crystallization, which again gives you a different idea, uh, another idea about having different number of water of crystallization molecules in different salts. Remember, copper salt has five water molecules attached to it. And if I move below this magnesium salt, though both of them are sulfate, this has seven water molecules, which means different salts have different number of water molecules attached. Now, do you know uh, whether to heat the mixture or not? Carbonates and magnesiums are handled in cold. And most other substances are heated for the reaction to occur. This is an easier tip which will tell you whether you need to heat the whole mixture or not. So whenever you're reacting with magnesium, do not heat it. It's reactive enough. You won't need to heat it. When you're reacting with carbonates, they are reactive enough. You don't need to heat. Otherwise, for most other substances, you need to heat the system for the reaction to occur in a good amount of time. Optimized. Which finishes all the formation of soluble salts except sodium, potassium, and ammonium. So we will be starting with sodium, potassium, and ammonium salts a little later. I think we should be doing it in the next set.